Hi, welcome to the Nature Box Kids Art Workshop where we're going to go through a series of different art processes um, throughout the tutorial. So um, what I'm going to ask of you is that you go for a big walk through whatever part of nature that you have near you. It could be parks, lucky enough if you have a beach near you, um, woodland, you can just use materials from the back garden you just go for a walk around the block see what you find maybe some weeds and things like that but i want you to collect i'll give you some ideas so you can collect shells feathers leaves rocks petals and um, anything that you find from nature that we're going to use today um, to have some fun and make some art so the first thing that we're going to make today is a nature mandala and for a lot of you you might not have heard of the word mandala so it is a sanskrit term and it means circle so in fact a mandala is a circular structure with a design that radiates out symmetry into a unifying center so it's one of nature's most perfect configuration so i will show you some examples of what that looks like later on. And um, if you think in terms of the petals of a flower to the rings of a tree, spider's webs, seashells, crystals, and more. So while they're beautiful, there is a deeper meaning to the mandala that we can introduce. So the mandala can be interpreted as a model for the organized or the organizational structure of life or a type of cosmic diagram. It is both microcosm, which is small, and macrocosm, which is large, like the universe. So we are all part of its intricate design. Circle and its three-dimensional form called the sphere are powerful figures in our world. We see them throughout nature, art, religion, and philosophy. And in that, the circle represents unity and the cyclical or the cycle of nature and of life itself. So to the human eye, circles and spheres are abundant in nature and in our universe. They can occur naturally in planets, stars, tree rings, raindrops, or they can be even man-made, such as traffic, roundabouts, buttons, footballs, and even pizzas. So circles and spheres occur as a result of uniform growth from a central point, and they can represent balance between inward and outward forces. Sometimes they are obvious, but sometimes we have to look a little, little bit longer. So have a think about it. And can you name any circles that happen naturally in nature? So before we start even constructing our mandala, what we might have to do is separate some of our lovely finds that we have. So for example, can you see there? This is from my garden, I hasten to add. So I picked um, some pink flowers that came on a bunch. But for the sake of the mandala, what I might do is I might take some time to separate out some of the flowers so I can use them in a smaller way. This again is a fern. So what I might do with this is I might make it into smaller shapes so that I can get some linear forms like this. Some of the shapes that I found out in nature, I found these dried seed heads. So again, some of them have little seeds still on them attached from last year. So I might separate them out and I could even, if I wanted to, separate out the sticks and have different lengths or similar lengths if we're going to make, create symmetry from that. So when you're constructing your mandala, um, or even if you're at the point of still out collecting and foraging for stuff, have a think about what colours and what textures you'd like to contain in your mandala. Do you want it to be a bright, vibrant colour with different coloured petals? Or do you want to go for more earthy, sort of brown, muted tones? Think about the textures and the shapes you're collecting. For some things you want long, kind of um, linear shapes. Others you might want them kind of rounded and... Um, other, you might want hard textures or soft textures and have a think of all the different shapes and sizes because to make anything or construct anything um, that is an image, like an art image, 
we, our eyes like to look at differing sort of textures and sizes and scales. So think about all that when you're collecting your um, objects and when you're even breaking things down into smaller components and shapes for yourself. So what I am going to do before I start my mandala is I have set up all of my stuff that I want to use, my objects that I want to use. I have them just out of the frame of this so that they are readily available for me to start constructing my mandala. One thing that I want to say to you is I have to do this on front of a camera. So I am using my table and I have this tablecloth on, which doesn't look very nice, but you actually could really think about where you want to construct your mandala. So you might actually want to leave it out. You might want to construct it out somewhere where you've been from your walk so someone can come along it. Um, and find something beautiful that you have made or you can make it out your back garden or your front garden or obviously you're welcome to make it anywhere you want in your house as well and um, so but for here what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start on my table and they say that to construct a mandala it is maybe pick something that has some meaning and place it in the center so what I have picked for the center of my mandala is this gorgeous pine cone that I found. And that pine cone is going to represent new growth, new beginnings, uh, hopefully a better time that we're going to move into in 2021, where beautiful things will happen. So I have that in the center. And then I'm going to start thinking about what I'm going to place around it. So you can see that this is a dark, heavy object. So what I thought might be really nice is to go with something light, which are these little hyacinth flowers. And I am going to start to begin to construct my circle around this. I'm going to face the flowers outwards. We're just working away around the pine cone. I could go too deep as well, which means that I could create, because I have a lot of these now. they're all used up. Beautiful. For my next concentric circle what I might do is I showed you earlier on the filming cutting up the sticks so what I might do is create some linear shapes now so every time I go one direction I, I hop to its mirror direction to create symmetry. There so what do you think I should add now? Do you think we need a bit more color? Do you think I should go green or I should go... That's my dog barking in the background, if you can hear that. Barking, wants to go for a walk. <laughs> now. So oh, what do you think I should put next? Some green or some colour? Now you can see that I've added some large green vibrant leaves to balance out the lighter tones um, and the more delicate shapes of the flowers. What will we do next? So now you can see I've added some ferns going in a different direction on the outside and some lovely rose petals for some bright colour. So next I'm going to start thinking about some pink flowers. So I finished with my pink flowers and I had some of these um, seed heads but I didn't, I only had four of these shapes. 
So I placed one at north, one at south, one at east and one at west. And now I think I'm going to look for something that I might have that will create some nice, shining, bright, strong radial lines from the outside. So now you can see that I've added a few more stuff. I've added some pebbles on top of my petals. I've added some primroses from the garden and some leaves from the outside. But sadly, I'm going to have to stop there because it's as big as my table. But if you're building it outside, you can just watch it grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so thank you. Now we move on to the next little nature project that we have. And now for our next fun nature project is we are going to make a weaving of some of the stuff that we found from nature. So for that, what we're going to need is we're going to need some twine or ribbon or any type of string that you have at home. If you can't get your hands on some twine, you're going to need four sticks. So you can see the length I have, like perfect sticks for a dog, those type of sticks so that they won't bend because we are going to be putting a bit of pressure on them and four So you can see I have it laid out there and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my twine, I'm going to attach it, I'm going to try it as tight as I can there and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to wind it, pulling it nice and tight. And when I have it maybe wound, let's say 10 or so times one way, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go the opposite direction, keeping that little bit of string out from the start so I can attach it. Nice and tight. Four. Probably should have left a little bit longer, just nice and tight. And now, like magic, I will have all four done in a second. So now we are going to make the loom for our weaving. So what you need is you need your twine again and your scissors. This time you're going to need an awful lot more twine in your hand. So what I would do is I would wrap it around my hand and start to create a little spool of twine on your hand. So I'm an adult, so I'm going to do it a certain number of times. So I'm going to get you to do it 50 times around your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And on, and on. Yeah. I'm going to do it because my hands are bigger. Ooh, maybe 30 times. And then don't worry if it ends up, it's not long enough. We can just tie it off and continue. So I'm happy with around this amount there. Now to start the loom. So just like before, when we went into the corner, I'm going to start on the corner and I'm going to tie it off. One, tie, two, and three for good luck. And then with the spool, I'm going to wrap it around once, twice around the long base. So we're going to work up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down until we reach the other side. And we're going to try and get as many little lines of weaving for the loom that we can work with of strength. So I've gone around that once. I'm going up here. I'm going 
back but instead of going back down I'm going to go around the stick twice and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it there I'm going to go around my stick and I'm going to weave it to the top go around twice And keep going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down until I reach the far corner. So now we are ready. We have our loom made and we are ready to start some of our weaving. So I think particularly at the start, I like to add something that has long lines like sticks or any stems that you have. So I have these kind of dead papery um, daffodils. So I'm going to use them first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start. I'm going to start to weave these in. And you go in, above, and out, and you have two. In and out. Over and out. Over one line and under one line. And then we're going to push that down. Now I'm going to start on this side. I'm going to go under that line. Under that line. Over that line. Over that line. Over that line. And then push this down as well. And keep going. So I'm going to under. And I'm going to do around 10 of those daffodils. It depends on what size loom you've made before you can start adding other materials. So remember, mine is a representation of the stuff that I found, but yours will be a representation of all the stuff that you've gathered and collected. So try and include as much textures and colours as you can and just keep weaving in and out and making sure that you're pushing it down so that it's building up a strength and you can just put and add whatever you want to yours. So I've reached a point now where I'm really happy with my nature loom because I, I quite like the exposed bit of twine up but I'm going to hang it up on my wall and I'm going to just spend a bit of time maybe every day looking at it and yes. seeing how the colours change and textures change and this will remind me of that beautiful walk that I did with my two kids. I think it is. Look at these large looms that people have made for their back gardens that you can add to. Wouldn't that be absolutely fantastic? I thought let's do a project where we use up some of our finds that we found on our walk so we're going to do a printing project so the what I have for this is I have a large piece of roll out paper you could use wallpaper anything that you have to hand you can use smaller sheets as well but I'm going to use a large roll because I thought it would be really nice to print onto it and use it as wrapping paper afterwards so we can roll it back up again when we're finished and then use it as we need it um, for wrapping paper for lovely presents and um, I have some pieces of cardboard here I have a sponge I have out of shot a few acrylic paints you could use poster paints if you wanted I also have some different size brushes I think a sponge is going to be handy for this though and of course I have my leaves and flowers and things like that so if I move all of this stuff out of the way and I have a tray that's just an old mushroom tray that I've squeezed some of my green paint into and I have a sheet of cardboard here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to sponge on my green paint. You add, you can use a brush if you want. So 
I, I thought it would be a good idea to use the sponge because it might give me a more even layer. So I'm going to roll that out, move it around a little bit so it's not sitting in a big lump. Bring the brush down, dip into it with my sponge, try and get a little bit on like this. And then start to, I'll definitely need more paint than that. And what I'm doing is I'm sponging on green paint. Trying to lay some of the leaves are curled up. It mightn't catch to every single bit. But we're going to try and give it a bit of crash there. Now, then, with this and pieces of cardboard out of the way, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my leaf down. I'm going to take a piece of cardboard now. I'm going to rub my hand along on top of it to just get a nice even print. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I'm going to go again. Actually, it says acrylic, but it's more like a poster paint. It's much thinner than thick acrylic paint. But that's nice. It gives a nice kind of faded print. Now, at this time, I might change the direction of the leaf. Go back in with the cardboard. back the leaf and I'll just see for you to see that there now. I get a beautiful leaf prints. So I'm going to continue here and here and you can come back to me and I'll then move on to a different leaf shape. So you can see now that I have printed four or five prints of the ferns and you can see the beautiful I don't know what the camera's picking up but there's it nearly looks like fossilized beautiful detail some of it's still drying out so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put out a more vibrant color so for this I have a poster paint purple my daughter's favorite color so I'm going to put some purple out and what I have to print is I have some primroses or um, I have some leaves here as well, different shapes. So what I find with printing, particularly if you're printing out a whole long sheet of the wrapping paper, will be to start off with the big ones and then kind of work into more interesting shapes. So you can see that the fern is all broken up in shapes. So it's broken up into lines and it's bronze and it's beautiful and decorative and lots of negative and positive space which means in and out and in and out and in and out so what I thought to do is I'm going to use this bay leaf I'm going to use the back of it because the back has the lovely ridges of veins because I would like to see them printed up and for this what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a brush a soft brush like this nearly like a household brush it's a little bit smaller um, and I'm going to brush on my purple poster paint so just brush it on there i'm going to even brush it along 
the stamp because I quite like that in the prints. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move it around the page. So I'm going to place it down here, paint down where you can see it. And again, I'm going to take a clean piece of um, cardboard, place it on top, rub my hands, or you can press with this part of your hand. It's called burnishing. And you're rubbing it along so that every point of the leaf makes contact. Peel it up slowly. Wow, beautiful, isn't it? So, we will continue to do that. Um, where I place them is quite random with this, but what you could create a kind of design. You could go backwards and forwards and, you know, create a line along the edges, a border, or whatever you want to do. And now for my last colour, what I might do is, I'm not even going to wash my brush, I'm going to dip in to blue. I'm going to paint it along on the cardboard. And what I'm going to do is, this time I'm going to pick up, I'm using a flower, and the petals are much more delicate than the leaves are. So I'm going to press it on, I'm going to pick it up like that, and I'm going to... Press it down. There. Beautiful. Pick it up again. Pick up the paint. I'm going to print the other side of that because one of the petals fell off. I might go back in, paint on some blue. Pick it in. Turn around. Give it another print. Beautiful. Dip back in. Paint on the blue here. Now at this point what I'd say is your petal is starting to disintegrate your flowers. So maybe just one more print. Move it around. Beautiful. Well, just because I'm a maximalist not a minimalist, I might do, because I have yellow, I might just add some yellow in as well. So the way you can do this, I use a new brush on that. Um, I get messy now, which is what I like. So I have a primrose, and I'm going to paint the primrose yellow, a primrose yellow. Not paying attention to what I'm supposed to be doing, which is painting it onto the card. Now you'll find, have you ever found before with yellow paint, the pigment just isn't as strong as any other colour. That's because there are less paint particles in yellow paint than there is in any other paint colour. So if you've ever found that you're painting a picture of the sun or the sun is in your picture, if you add a little bit of white, which I do not have, to your yellow, it makes it more opaque. So there's a little tip for you. Now we're printing this onto yellow paper, so it's going to be quite subtle, but print. Dip in again. And this way, isn't that beautiful wrapping paper? Wouldn't you be delighted if you got a lovely present of this, wrapped in this? Now, I'm going to stop there. You can see it all by detail. Beautiful, isn't it? So now I thought I'd just come back and show you some repeat print where you just, instead of making a random or scattered pattern, you make a more organized print. So here's two examples. This one, the blue one where I dipped into other colours, was the leaf, but instead of, yeah, randomly placing it, if there's a methodical, there's an order, they're all in a line. And then this one where they're slightly scattered, but still organised all together. Could you guess what this is? It wasn't a leaf, it was 
a vegetable. Yeah, that's right, it was an onion. Um, but I think that makes a beautiful print as well because I love the kind of space between them, the way it makes this kind of zigzag shape as well. Um, so see what you have in your house, what you can print up, and I'll show you some other examples. In these examples, rainbow colours were used, so lots of colours were dipped onto and printed on top of one another, or a scattered print of lovely bright summer colours, or printed up like as if they're growing, it looks like a meadow. And here is an example of the use of beautiful wrapping paper. It's pretty, you guys can't even see how gorgeous the real colours are. Maybe because the paper is much more vibrant, but isn't it beautiful? Who wouldn't want that as a present? So now, welcome along for the last little mini tutorial that we're going to do today. So I racked my brain and I was thinking, what can I, I still have little bits of twigs and stuff left over. And how can I use up some of the twine and even some of the leaves that I've used for the print and leftover leaves. And what will I make? So my daughter, one of her favorite things is to wear headbands and crowns and things like that and equally my son thinks he is a little warrior so what I thought was I'm going to make some crowns for them so some nature crowns so I had some cardboard I didn't have a piece that was long enough for their heads so all I'm going to do is I cut some strips up from here and I'm going to attach them join them together I'm just going to use the solid tape because we're going to use a fair edge solid tape in this so by the time we're finished we will have used up a lot of sellotape in fact if you had gaffer tape or something like that that would be even handier i'm going to stick it on the other side i mean obviously if you had a glue gun you could do some of this with a glue gun but most people don't have glue guns or a lot of people don't so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to stick with the sellotape to show you how easy this is to just come together and I don't want to lose the end of my salad because that is a terrible nuisance to find again. So you see there, I have a strip there that's long enough for a six-year-old's head. Come here, soon to be six. Um, so that's what I'm going to work with. So I'll tell you this one. And now what I'm going to get going with is I'm going to do a background of twigs. So... I've broken up a few twigs to get going with, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to line them up, overlap them if needs be, and start to create a little bit of height. So they will, if they're too big, I would recommend that you break them down a little bit. I have them, you can see this length. So just put this coming off. And I'm going to just keep going with this. And what I might do actually. Instead of waiting till I have it all in a line, what I might do is I might just start to stick those bits on. So you can see how it will be very handy with a glue gun now, wouldn't it? But not for little hands if they want to make it. I wouldn't recommend it. And then just keep going all the way around. So you can see here, I have very bendy sticks. So I actually decided to stop them here at this point. You can see that the, the salad tape is slightly pulling away and I pressed it in. If you wanted this to be more durable, what you could do is you could add in touches of wood glue or PVA in there. Obviously it would leave it overnight to dry but you can probably continue working on it a little bit with the PVA seeping out until it dries. Um, to make it a little bit more secure now what I'm going to do is I have some twine from earlier on so what I've done is I've doubled it up and I've taken the length, I've tied it one end and the other side is 
obviously the double, it's a double piece. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed this in somewhere in the middle, the center. Take it in. Put it through. And then pull down on it. <laughs> and what I'm going to start to do is I'm going to start to pull down on the twine and I'm going to start to wrap the twine. Remember when we were wrapping the loom and we were pulling tight? Well, this it's like that. Just wrapping it through, wrapping it around, feeding it in and out. It will help secure the tape and it will also, if you have put glue in there, it will Now, and we fit out. What I'm going to do is we're going to move on to another piece and we're going to just go over that again until all that twine is not you tight. And then we have this, just like when we fed things in through the loom, we're going to feed things in through this, which I'll show you in a second. So you can see I brought it up one side and now I have another piece and what I do is feeding it in and out and then I'm going to work my way down this side. And every so often remember it, pull really taut until it's kind of pulling it on the edges of the cardboard. And then that's as far as I'm going to go there. So with this, what you could do is you could tie it off. For the moment, I feel that the tape is strong enough. I can choose to reinforce it. Better. And you could glue the back of it on. So what you could do afterwards is you could put some glue along this twine here so that at the end so that it's more secure again. So there we go. Now we're ready for the next stage. So now what I'm going to start to do is feed some of my longer green filler bits up through. So I started my first point was near enough the middle and I started to exactly like the loom, just over one, under one, over one, under one. And just pull it through um, like that. Moving it down just inch by inch. And then trying to not break the leaves too much. Move it down. Yeah, I feel like that probably would be better if I used slightly shorter bits so that I didn't have to weave it quite so much. So I'm going to stick with the burn for the moment. Do the same. What did you collect? So what are you going to use? Do you have any feathers? Feathers would be really good at the stage, wouldn't they? Um, which I think I have a buzzard feather somewhere upstairs, so I might add that to it. I didn't want to use that for the printing because I quite love it. <laughs> I didn't want to paint on it, but I wouldn't mind putting it in this. So you can see there, ferns, I think they look great. These are ones actually that I use for the print, so they're even more vibrant green than nature itself. Um, I love some flowers in this. So these are hydrangeas. So these were in someone's garden, but a lot of people leave the dried hydrangea heads on over the winter time. So if you went out on a sunny day, rare I know, but you were to find some hydrangeas, you can break them up. And these are a lovely um, bulky filler for this. You can put some paint on that as well. So I'm going to start, you can see, 
I don't think it's a lovely sound, don't they? A lovely crunch. Wintry crunch. Why not that sound? You can see it's starting to fill up now and clear this away and um, what we wanted was the cardboard to slightly disappear and everything else we're, we're acting like florists now and we're filling up the spaces so i actually think i'm gonna have to go out for another walk to get some more interesting colors and shapes and textures so see you back soon So now for the moment, I think I've reached a stage where it's quite full and I'm going to let my daughter, when she comes home from school, have a final say about what goes in her headdress. But well, what can be done once that's all decided, like she might want to paint the sticks, she might want to embellish, as I say, add the buzzard feather, or like I wonder what you have in yours. Did you have a trip to the sea? If so, there might be an awful lot of shells. Um, wired into this so she might she'll have the final say and I'll upload and I'll put some pictures of it on I won't you can just tape it there actually gaffer tape at the end would definitely kind of help it or staple it into place so I will move the camera up and I will try it on for you so you can see my wild wild crowd <laughs> thank you so much bye bye do your little nature dance. Yay!